Welcome to Principal Center Radio, helping you build capacity for instructional leadership. Here's your host, Director of the Principal Center, Dr. Justin Bader. Welcome everyone to Principal Center Radio. I'm your host, Justin Bader, and I'm honored to be joined today by author Dan Heath. Dan is a senior fellow at Duke University's Case Center, which focuses on social justice entrepreneurship. And he's, of course, the author of four New York Times bestselling books, including Made to Stick, Switch, Decisive, and The Power of Moments. And we're here today to talk about his new book, Upstream, The Quest to Solve Problems Before They Happen. And now, our feature presentation. Dan, welcome to Principal Center Radio. Thank you, Justin. Great to be here. Well, I'm so excited to talk about this concept of dealing with upstream problems, because I think particularly in education, as well as in other sectors like healthcare, often we're dealing with the downstream consequences of problems that we know have upstream roots. I wonder if you could take us into that that upstream kind of metaphor and uh, what some of the dimensions of the the challenge of solving problems upstream are. So this is a parable that's often attributed to a guy named Irving Zola, a sociologist, and it goes like this. You and a friend are having a picnic uh, on the bank of a river, and you've laid out your picnic blanket. You're just about to start your meal when you hear a shout from the direction of the river, and you turn around, you look over your shoulder, and it's a child kind of thrashing about in the water, apparently drowning. So you instinctively dive in, you grab the child, you swim to shore, and and, and no sooner have you uh, saved them and your adrenaline starting to recede, then you hear another shout. You look back, it's a second child also seeming to be drowning. So back in the water you go, you fish them out. No sooner have you gotten them to the shore than you hear two shouts. There's two kids in the river now, and, and so begins a kind of revolving door of rescue, and it's it's making you increasingly fatigued and uh, just as you're starting to lose hope, you see your your friend swimming toward the shore and steps out as though to leave you alone. And you say, hey, where are you going? I can't keep up with this by myself. And your friend says, I'm going upstream to tackle the guy who's throwing all these kids in the river. And I think that, in a nutshell, is what this book is about. That so many times in our work, in our lives, uh, even in the nation as a whole, and I, and I say this right in the thick of the coronavirus scare, we find ourselves in this cycle of reaction. We respond to emergencies, we put out fires, we fish those kids out of the drowning river every day, but we never go upstream to address the sources of the problems we find ourselves fighting. And in the book, Upstream, what I'm doing is making a case that we need to shift more of our focus, more of our time, more of our resources upstream for the sake of preventing problems before they happen. And so often in education, as you said, we we do get focused on solving that downstream problem because it's it's the one right in front of us, right? We see the kid floating by, we jump in, you know, there's a there's an immediate benefit to that swift action. And that swift action is so all-consuming that often we don't feel like we really have the bandwidth to go upstream, uh, you know, and, and especially in education where the upstream causes of some of the biggest challenges we face quickly start to move outside of what we perceive as our uh, our scope or our realm. And I, I was making a connection to the, uh, the Expedia story that you share in the book where uh, the customer service department had, had gotten really good at dealing with customer calls. You know, customer calls, they have a problem. The customer gets help quickly. The call is ended quickly. The customer is satisfied. So everybody uh, feels great about that. And yet somebody did something that identified a problem and really started to fix that problem. Take us into the Expedia story, if you would. How did leaders at Expedia realize they had a problem? They realized they had a problem when a guy named Ryan O'Neill went through the data and discovered a, a jaw-dropping statistic, which is that for every 100 customers, this is back in 2012, by the way, for every 100 customers who booked a flight or a hotel or a car, 58 of them ended up calling the call center for some kind of help. I mean, almost six out of 10 people, which, is, of course, nullifies the whole point of having a an online self-serve travel site. So Ryan and his colleagues are like, what the hell's going on here? And they dig into the data. What they find is that the number one reason people are calling is to get a copy of their itinerary. That's it, to get a copy of their itinerary. 20 million 
calls were logged in 2012. That's like every man, woman, and child in Florida calling Expedia in one year to get a copy of their itinerary. And so, you know, they they convene a war room across functions to, to work on this, and the solutions are very simple. They range from setting up a provision on the IVR to deal with people, you know, press two if you're calling for a copy of your itinerary. Uh, they can change the way they send the itinerary so so many of them don't end up in people's spam folders and so forth. It's not a difficult technical challenge. But for me, the real import of this story is how do you get in that situation? I mean, as you said, up until that point, they had been measuring their call center folks on how quickly can you resolve customers' issues and how happy are the customers when you're finished? So can you go from three minutes to two and a half minutes to two and a quarter minutes? Can you nudge up customer satisfaction levels? But they had stopped asking an even more important and basic question, which was, can we stop customers from needing to call us at all? And what they did once this issue was on their radar was, they begin to work across silos because ultimately this was a problem that was created by organizational structure. And what I mean is you've got the marketing team at Expedia whose job it is to get people to the site to choose Expedia over Hotels.com or uh, Google Travel or whatever. And then you've got the product team whose job it is to create such an easy, fluid experience that people are funneled down to a transaction and then you've got the tech team whose job it is to make sure things are humming smoothly. And then you've got the call center people who, as I said, are measured on you know time to resolution. And if you look across all these silos and you ask whose job is it to prevent those calls from ever happening, the answer is nobody. And in fact, it's even worse than that, that no one even stood to benefit if the calls began to go down. It, it would not have gotten anyone a raise or anyone a bonus if they had diminished the number of calls. Uh, just to cap off this story, what eventually happened is essentially all 20 million of those calls vanished once they paid attention to this. There were other kinds of calls they received that were a bit more complicated, but those 20 million calls, that's just gravy. I mean, at $5 a piece, that's a $100 million solution. And, and to come into the world of education, I mean, ev every sector in the world has a comparable silo problem. And I imagine some principals listening to this are nodding their heads right now. It's just the way organizations are designed, right? We push people to specialize. We, we push them into disciplines. We push them into business units. And, and specialization creates efficiency. That's why we do it. It makes people faster. It makes people more productive. But it also defies our ability to solve really thorny problems that require lots of pieces of the puzzle to be assembled at the same time. So let's let's get to the villain of our story here. And and this is definitely, I think, going to provoke some nods among listeners because uh, I've spent a lot of time with principals over the years. And I know uh, what I'm about to share with you is a study of nurses, but I think we could just as well pretend it's about principals. So a woman named Anita Tucker studied nurses for her Harvard dissertation. She shadowed a bunch of nurses for hundreds of hours, just followed them around to see what their day was like. Their day was full of problem solving. As you can imagine, you know, it, something was always popping up. They ran out of towels. Where do we get towels? So they went and you know, stole some from the unit down the hall so that their patients would have them. Or the, the medication wasn't ready when it was supposed to be. And the, Anita Tucker writes about this one day that a nurse was trying to check out a mother, just had a baby, and the, the mother and baby were ready to go home. And part of the checkout is to take the security anklet off the baby. But in this case, it was missing. And that's a pretty big deal. So they started this frantic search and eventually turned up the anklet in the baby's bassinet. So problem solved, mother was discharged. Three hours later, the same nurse runs into the same problem again. It's a different mother, different baby. The anklet is missing again. So they start another search. This time, they can't find it at all. And so the nurse has to work around that and figure out some other way to discharge this, this mother and baby safely. So Anita Tucker paints this portrait of nurses as being very resourceful, they're improvisational. They're, they're constantly finding ways to work around problems. They don't go cry into the boss every time they hit a barrier. And when I present the story through that lens, it looks admirable. I mean, that's a, that's a nice portrait. But if you flip the lens a little bit and look at it from a different perspective, what I'm describing 
is a system that will never improve, a system that will never learn. Because what these nurses have adopted, in essence, is a culture of workarounds. You know, that they're so busy, there are so many demands on their times that when they run out of towels, they don't think, why do we run out of towels? They just are like, by God, I need some towels. They run down and steal them from another department, meaning that the other department is likely to have the same problem a couple hours down the line, right? And when you work around problems, it helps you in the moment, but it also dooms you to forever staying in that river fishing kids out of the water, right? Because you're never addressing the root causes. And, and this phenomenon that I'm talking about, you know, constantly being stuck in a cycle of workarounds and reaction is something that I call tunneling, which is a phrase I stole from, from another book that's wonderful if you love uh, psychology books. It's, it's from a book called Scarcity. And the authors use this metaphor of when we have a scarcity of, of time or a scarcity of resources, what happens is we kind of give up trying to solve all of those, all of those problems systematically. And instead, it's like we slip into this tunnel vision. You know, picture yourself in a tunnel. And the only direction to go in a tunnel is, is forwards. You know, and, and, and so you know, the nurses figure out we're out of towels. What do they do? They figure out some way to keep moving forward. They, they grab some towels from down the hall. Same thing in education, right? You're, you're kind of a pinballing from one problem to the next. You're just trying to survive the day. You're just trying to, to deal with the stuff that's on your plate. And tunneling is a great, great trap. And I would say it's maybe the single greatest thing that we fight in trying to get upstream and, and I, I am not aware of any, you know, simple solutions. I'm not here with three easy tricks to get out of the tunnel. I think this is really hard. But I, I think the, the saving grace is that a little bit of time out of the tunnel can go a long way. Like I'll give you one example just from healthcare. A lot of health systems have gone to a structure they call a safety huddle, where in the morning they might call together all the nurses and doctors in a certain department and they talk about, what happened the day prior? You know, were there any near misses yesterday where we almost gave a patient the, the wrong medication or, uh, or where, you know, some procedure almost went wrong? And what can we learn from that? And a forum like that, this is a quick meeting, maybe 20 minutes, everybody's standing up. You know, it's not one of these laborious staff meeting type meetings. A forum like that would have been the perfect place for that nurse that dealt with the two baby anklets that slipped off to say, hey, this weird thing happened yesterday. The, the anklets are slipping off the babies and, and we're not just putting them on too loose. I know because I put on some myself. We, we need someone to take charge of this. And so that's an example of where for 20 precious minutes every day, you figured out a way to get people out of those tunnels. And, and they may go right back in after the meeting is over, but at least you've had a time to kind of take a breath and say, hey, before we get back in the tunnels that we have to for this day, let's at least surface the things that we need to take seriously and start some more proactive problem solving. Well, and that strikes me as a great you know, informal definition of leadership, right? Of, of being able to step back and say, okay, we're not just here to put out one fire after another. We're also in, you know, the fire prevention business. How can we step back and see the bigger picture and see what's what's causing these these repeated problems? I think about uh, with uh, with discipline. Often, you know, administrators get kind of stuck in the office dealing with discipline issue after discipline issue after discipline issue, and, and then you got the parents, uh, you know, yelling at you from the other side when when you call them about their child. And upstream for many issues within schools is, of course the classroom, you know, so if, if we're not able to get into classrooms and see what's going on in terms of teaching and learning, we're only allowing ourselves to solve those downstream problems. We're, we're tunneling on the, uh, the discipline issue that gets the kid sent to the office. Yeah, well said. And, and I think um, a guy named Steve Spear had this, this great quote. He said that the, the impetus for change in these situations is an insufferable frustration, you know, people, and I think this is the kind of emotional inspiration to get out of the tunnel, is that day when you've just finally had enough. You know, you've been splashing around in the water, saving kids for too many days in a row, and you're like, this has to change. And I think if any of you listening are feeling like that, like, uh, imagine if your days, six months or a year from now, 
were the same as they are today, would you be happy or, or would you be, uh, would you find that intolerable? And if the answer is intolerable, the question is, what is going to allow you to be in a different spot? And, and I would contend that, that the only solution runs through this, this notion of upstream thinking. I was also struck by the statement, I underlined this in my copy of the book, that part of the problem as leaders might be our own addiction to being the hero, you know, to being the fixer, you know, to being the one people call and can count on to show up and fix the problem. You know, th there's a certain uh, kind of perverse reward system or, or incentive to uh, solving the immediate problem when that incentive isn't necessarily there to solve the upstream problem. What's going on with that heroism kind of kind of complex that we can find ourselves trapped in? Well said. I mean, as you said, it's a perverse reward system that, that our idea of a hero is somebody who saves the day. You know, the firefighters who put out the flames in a house and the, the lifeguard who jumps in to rescue the drowning kid and the first responders in an emergency. And and it's not that the day doesn't need to be saved sometimes. It does. But we don't pay attention to the people who keep the day from needing to be saved. And, and that's a kind of invisible hero that I really hold up in the book. And, and it's, it's not as dramatic, right? Like if uh, – I'll give you a concrete example. So the YMCA, who many of your elementary school principals may work with, the YMCA teaches more swim lessons than any other institution in the country. Um, and the YMCA for a while had had a fair number of drowning deaths every year, um, potentially just because of the sheer volume of, of kind of swimming hours logged in their pools. But they've taken it very seriously. And if you save a kid from drowning, you're a hero instantly. If you prevent a kid from drowning, well, A, how do you ever prove that that happened? You know, which kid would you point to and say, that's the life I saved? Um B, if you have really sophisticated data and you're able to establish in the data, hey, there was a downtick from, from time A to time B, and we're going to claim credit for that. Uh, even in that situation, it's not clear who gets you know, the blue ribbon. Like, who, who's the hero? Because these are often really boring incremental changes that happen. Like at the Y, it involved learning to push the lifeguard's chair closer to the pool to eliminate blind spots and teaching scanning techniques where the lifeguards are taught to scan the pool every 10 seconds, top to bottom, uh, left to right. Uh, they're forbidden to bring cell phones up on the chair just to prevent distractions. They, they rotate a lot because it's hard to maintain that level of focus for a long time, just like TSA agents at the airport. And, and on and on these kind of incremental improvements. And those are rolled out you know, boring training session after session where half of the teenage lifeguards are rolling their eyes because it all seems like too much. But the net effect of all that work is kids' lives really are saved. I mean, heroism happened. And, and part of the reason that I write this book, that I wrote this book, is uh, I wanted to teach us to pay more attention to these folks who are doing the boring work of keeping the day from needing to be saved. And I think there's so much potential for that in schools. It's like some of these perpetual problems that we fight, if we just changed our headspace a little bit, could we learn to stop these problems before they happen? Dan, can you give us an example of th that approach to upstream thinking uh, within the, the K-12 setting? Yes. Uh, one of my favorite stories in the book is about the Chicago public school system. And, and, uh, and hang with me here. It, it's going to take a little bit to tell the story, but I think this story, uh, maybe more than any other in the book, captures so many of the themes of upstream work. So I think it's, it's worth the investment here. So let me start with, with the bleak news. Uh, about 20 years ago, CPS had a graduation rate of about 52%. I mean, you had a, a coin flips chance of graduating as, as a teenager in CPS. And uh, the amazing thing about situations like that is when you've been living in a world like that for a long time, uh, you know, imagine you're a, a junior history teacher and every year you see the graduate rate about 50%. It's not that you think that's a good thing. I mean, you, you're appalled by it, I, I suspect. But it's, it's like you come to take it for granted. You just think, well, that's 
the way the world is. You know, these kids have difficult lives and maybe they haven't been well served by their K through eight education and uh, their parents don't have a lot of resources and there's a lot of crime in their neighborhoods. Wh- whatever the reasons are that you come up with, you sort of just shrug your shoulders and you say, I can't do anything about that. Well, the good news is at CPS, there were a bunch of school leaders who decided we are going to do something about this. And no, this is not natural and this is not inevitable and we can we can alter this. Now, I think the first realization you've got to have is in big systems like CPS, one of my favorite quotes that I came across in researching this book is from Paul Batalden, a healthcare expert. And he said, every system is perfectly designed to get the results it gets. And I think that's so true. And when you've got a district that's failing half of your students, that means there are huge systemic forces that are engineered to fail students. Uh, I'll give you one example in this case. One thing they figured out was that their own discipline policies were sabotaging students. Like in that time, this was the era of, you know, zero tolerance tolerance and uh, tough on discipline. And um, as, as somebody told me, Kids were suspended not for bringing like a knife to school. They were suspended because a couple of kids shoved each other in the hallway and boom, both were uh, slapped with a two-week suspension. And what we know now, based on a lot of data, is if you take a kid who's at risk, you kick them out of school for two weeks, I mean, guess what happens? They're sunk. They come back to school. They're lost. They end up failing. When you fail in the ninth grade, uh, you can doom yourself really for all of high school. And I'm not being uh, over dramatic there. In fact, uh, one of the key turning points in the story at CPS was when some academics discovered that there was a simple way to predict in the ninth grade with 80% accuracy who was going to graduate and who wasn't. It's was a metric called freshman on track. Many of you may be familiar with it. It had two simple components. Did, did the freshmen uh, complete five full year course credits and uh, did they avoid failing more than one core course I mean, math english history sort of thing uh, failing one semester was okay but if you failed two that that really puts you at unique risk because that was freshman on track and notice what's missing right the, there's no racial component of that metric there's no family income component there's not even a past performance component in fact they found that that eighth graders that were in the top quartile of performance, the best students who were off track as freshmen, were way less likely to graduate than the worst performers in eighth grade who were on track as freshmen. So, so all of a sudden, this metric gives you a kind of smoke detector, right, for, for early warning of potential dropout rates, and that opened the door for them to do something about it. So uh, I mentioned the discipline policies that they changed. One of the coolest things that they did, and I think uh, this is something we could talk about in other contexts too, is they changed the way that the faculty work together. They organized what they call freshman success teams, where the ninth grade faculty started meeting across disciplines. You know, they'd have a, a, a meeting of a couple of biology teachers, a couple of English, a couple of math, the counselor. And, and when they had these meetings, what they were doing is going name by name down a list of freshmen organized by who was most likely to be off track. Because keep in mind, off track is something that you can declare once a year after the freshman year is over. And that's too late. Right? In May, you figure out Dan's off track. Well, guess what? The damage has been done. You've got to have more proximate metrics. And so part of the work was when they organized these freshman success teams, they figured out ways to arm them with fresh, relevant data. Okay, uh, was Dan in school every day last week? Okay, check. Yeah, his attendance was good. How's he doing in math? Last week it looked like his, his grades were trending down. Uh, how did he do on his last um, you know, midterm exam and so forth? So just as an asterisk, I know a lot of principals listening to this can imagine just the sheer volume of work that went into arming people with that level of data. I mean, imagine it. Data on 100 kids from last week based on attendance in every course, their, their grades up to that moment. There are some Herculean IT efforts that, that went into this story. Anyway, what you figure out is when you have the right data, when you have the right direction, and when you have a motivation to care, uh, things change. 
And meeting by meeting, school by school, month by month, they start budging these numbers. They get attendance up. They start boosting their grades. They, they give people, ex, the students, extra help when they need it. Uh, and the freshman on track numbers start to go up. And, and what happens four years later is just as the metric predicted, they start graduating in, in greater and greater numbers. And fast forward to the last few years, the graduation rate has been more like 78%. I mean, 25 plus points added to the graduation rate which is uh, the equivalent of graduating tens of thousands of more students who will now have a radically different life as a result of this work. And so if, if you're in the midst of some kind of despair about how hard it is to get things done in your school or in your district, I'm not saying it's not hard, it is hard, but I want you to take hope from a district like CPS a $6 billion district with over 300,000 students, they managed to execute a change this big. It is possible, but it takes a lot of upstream thinking and a lot of upstream work. Well, let's, let's zoom in on a couple of the key elements of that upstream work there. One thing that really strikes me about their use of data was that, you know, we use tons of data, we have tons of data, we collect probably more than we need, but they were very selective about what they focused on. They, they really zoomed in on some metrics that were predictive and that were simple. You know, like, are we seeing this kid in school or is this kid absent a lot? You know, are they failing a certain number of courses? Are they passing all of their core courses? And, you know, really prioritizing helping individual kids succeed on those metrics. Why do you think that kind of case by case, you know, for, for a school that has 1,400 students or 2,000 students, it might seem like the stupidest idea ever <laughs> to say we're going to solve this problem one kid at a time because we want to be systems thinkers, right? We want to say, okay, we're, we're going we're gonna to do something school-wide that's going to work for everyone. But in example after example in Upstream, there's a case-by-case -case, uh, approach that really led people to the solutions. A critical lesson here, because you're right, there's a seeming paradox here that that you know, I started the story with the notion that, that CPS was a system designed to fail half its students, and it's a $6 billion system. And so that makes you think, gosh, this is going to have to happen at the 50,000-foot level, and there's going to have to be vast changes in policies. And, uh, and, and the reality was the actual progress was made at the micro level, that, that macro starts with micro. And I think the reason that makes sense is because you don't really understand a system until you've gotten right up close to it, until you've immersed yourself in it. And so the way this would work is, is in the course of talking about the case of Michael, you know, a potentially off-track ninth grader in November of his freshman year, you start to notice the texture of these stories and you start to come across things like, oh my God, this, this suspension thing is crazy because – uh, we know from our own data, if a kid's out of school for two weeks, they're virtually certain to be off track as a freshman. So we need to fix that. The, the texture leads you to the systemic policy. And then you notice things like, well, you know, we're having a, a bunch of students who, who are failing math in one teacher's class, but not in another teacher's class. Well, that says maybe there's something going on with, with the second teacher's curriculum. Maybe they figured out a better way to teach this. Let's go investigate that. That, that the way you, you understand the plumbing of a system is to get that close to it, that, that macro starts with micro. And that's a theme I never saw coming before I started this research. And then it started popping up again and again and again in, in very different contexts. Like uh, another one that you, that you alluded to was there is a, uh, a group in Newburyport, Massachusetts, it's, it's about a 45 minute drive outside of Boston, that's focused on domestic violence. And in particular, the risk that domestic violence will escalate to homicide. And so notice the parallels here between the CPS story and this one. One of the first things they discovered that helped them was they discovered a predictive tool, um, a risk assessment tool where if women who had been the victim of domestic violence filled out a certain questionnaire, it had things like, um, does your um, does your abuser try to control your activities? Do they monitor your spending? Do they tell you who you can hang out with? Uh, has your abuser lost a job recently? Does your abuser have an alcohol problem? You know these kind of diagnostic questions, and then they would they would rank women in the community 
based on, you know, the risk assessment. Just as at CPS, they were essentially prioritizing students who were most likely to be off track. So that was the start. Just as they did in CPS, where they assembled this team that composed biology teachers and counselors and math, in Newburyport, they organized all the people with a stake in domestic violence. So you had domestic violence advocates, you had people from the health system, you had the police, you had parole officers, you had people from the DA's office. And for the first time, I mean, I can't tell you how, how rare this kind of structure is. They're all getting together in what they call uh, the domestic violence high risk team. And just as a CPS, the nature of their meetings is to go woman by woman, name by name, and talk about the particulars. You know, okay, um, what, uh, who's seen Darcy in the last week? And do we have an emergency plan ready for her? If something happens, do we know where she's going to go? Who needs to get called? Where is she going to get the money if she needs a hotel or a taxi? Uh, and they would make these plans. They would they would work with the police to do more drive-bys of, of the woman's home or the abuser's home just to, to send a message that they were paying attention. And in the year since they began this work, uh, in, in about the eight years before they started the work, there had been, uh, if memory serves, about 10 or 12 homicides in the area. And in the decades since they've started this work, there have been zero, not one. And, and that's what happens when you get close enough to a problem to understand it, that the lesson here, I think, is you can't help a hundred people or a thousand or a million until you really understand how to help one. Those personal stories, those personal uh, kind of backstories to the problems that manifest themselves in particular ways within our context of, of school often have solutions or, or you know, long-term needs that we may have to partner with with people outside of the walls of our of our school to address. I think about some of the community partnerships around uh, supporting low income students that many people in our profession are, are pursuing right now. And, and one of the challenges that they've identified for attendance, especially at the elementary level, is simply around laundry. You know that if if you don't have a washer and dryer in your apartment, you have to go somewhere. You have to put quarters in the machine. You have to sit there for hours while it gets washed and dried. You have to get transportation home again. You know something that most of us who have washer and dryer in our home don't even have to think about constitutes this enormous. You know, and and we're worried about reading scores and not looking a little bit upstream to see. Okay, reading scores have a lot to do with attendance. What's behind the attendance pattern that we're seeing? Sometimes it's something as simple as laundry. And we turn around and we say, you know what? We already have a washer and dryer here in the office because this is an elementary school and we do that. That's a great example. I, I, I think that's a wonderful example of upstream thinking and, and the kind of thing that is never going to pop out of like a, a policy uh, discussion. You know what I mean? Uh, if you're thinking at the the policy level about attendance and, and uh, third grade reading and what have you, laundry's never going to pop out. That's something that popped out when people got really close up to the problem and they understood it. They were trying to help one kid and they realized, hey, what's keeping this kid out of school some days is he doesn't have clean clothes. And that's when the light bulb goes off. And, and that's another example of that, that uh, a, a micro leads to macro um, reality. The, the other thing I would say is um, this is hard stuff. I mean, at, at CPS, their timeline was, was 15, 20 years. I mean, this stuff does not happen fast. But, but you can see progress a lot faster than that. And in, in your shoes as a principal, I would be thinking about what's one recurring problem that you're dealing with, you know, year after year. And, and it might be different depending on what's the nature of your school. It, for you, it might be the dropout rate like CPS. Uh, it might be teacher retention. Um, you know, some of, the, some of the charter schools just have terrible teacher retention because they, they work them so hard. And so the schools are great, but the teachers churn so often it becomes a, a big problem. And, and if you take a problem, let's just use teacher retention as like a hypothetical. What are your levers in that situation? What, what can you do to move that? And a couple of levers that I just want to plant in your head are, number one, it's always easier to fix a problem when you can detect it coming early. And so notice, you know, at CPS, they had the freshman on track metric at the ninth grade year uh, it, with the high risk domestic violence team. 
they had the, um, the risk assessment tool. And so the first question would be, can you figure out ways to see it coming when a teacher is going to leave? And I'll give you one example just from personal experience. I was working with a well-known charter school who was dealing with this problem of teacher churn. And what I did to understand it was I just interviewed five or ten teachers who had, uh, who had left. I wanted to hear from them what the, what the responsible causes were. And, and there was some difference of opinions, as you would expect. But, but one surprising commonality was that they uh, – probably two-thirds of them said – that they had surfaced their dissatisfactions at their their kind of um, what did they call it? It was it was basically a meeting halfway through the year with with their supervisor, like a one on one. That that may be specific to this charter school that tradition, but but they would have a meeting, you know, January ish, just to kind of review where they were to get performance feedback and so forth. And these teachers were telling me like I surfaced these things. And, and apparently like the boss's temptation was just to sweep it under the rug. You know, they were probably tunneling and they didn't want to have to deal with it at that moment. So they just kind of made nice noises in the meeting and didn't do anything. And then six months later, the teachers were gone. But that tells you something, right? When you get up close to these cases and you realize, hey, that was an early warning possibility. It changes your mindset. Now, all of a sudden, these January meetings become very important because they're they're early warning signs and they buy you six months to do something different. Uh, as you get closer to the problems, you also come to understand the leverage points better. So, you know, in a complicated system, it can feel paralyzing because there's so many different variables. There's so many different things going on. You've got to find a couple of places to push. And so like at CPS, they figured out attendance was a great place to push because attendance is highly correlated to performance. And you can do something about attendance. You know, you can, you can be calling the morning when the students are out and you can be hounding them and, and let them know they're being watched. So that's a kind of basic game plan. If whatever the problem is that you're facing, that you're finding increasingly intolerable, you know, get close to it. Look at the specific cases, not the big picture. Look at the little picture. Uh, look for early warning signals and look for leverage points. So Dan, I, I really appreciate, you know, the kind of case by case and the, the cross-functional nature of, of some of this work. And I can certainly think about, you know, some, some great conversations that I had with our school nurse or, or even people, you know, outside of our staff who helped us really get our heads around a problem. But I, I also want to look at how we often make changes from the opposite direction, where sometimes instead of you know doing that detective work to find the root causes of, a, of an upstream problem, we instead start with a solution. And I think this is a, kind of an endemic problem in education where we say, okay, you know what? We're going to do that thing over there. We're going to bring it here, and that's going to fix all of our problems. Why do we default to that kind of you know import the solution thinking? And what is that? What wrong roads does that lead us down sometimes? Well, I think it comes out of a good instinct. I mean, we we want to fix a problem. So we're we're combing the world for solutions. Uh, but what we have to understand is when you intervene in complex systems, you often get surprised. So one of my favorite examples of this is in many companies, in many organizations, there's been a push toward open floor plans. And, and what's the motivation? The, the motivation is we want to get people collaborating more. You know, people are stuck in their silos. We want to get them talking. We're going to, we're going to physically put them closer together and we're going to take down the barriers, you know, no more cubicle walls and so forth. We had uh, open concept schools. Uh, we're a big, uh, a big fad. My wife taught in one of those and, uh, <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah. No classroom walls. That's interesting. So you've been through the fad too. So I, I'll be curious if the punchline is the same, but, uh, what happened was a couple of Harvard researchers tracked two Fortune 500 companies that were just about to move from their old model, which was more kind of siloed cubicle to the open office floor plan. And the question was, would they boost face-to-face -face interactions? And they used this kind of sci-fi technology called a sociometric badge, which people wore around their neck like a, like a lanyard. And, and what it did was it tracked who they talked to and how often they were talking it, it wasn't recording their conversation, so it wasn't something creepy, but it was just like, who are you talking to and, and how often? Uh, so they had really good data on the before and after here. And at the end of the study, what they figured out was once they moved to an open office floor plan, face-to-face -face interactions went down by about 70%. I mean, it, it wasn't even close. 
they they had almost ended face to face interactions by going to open office. And so you scratch your head and you say, wait a second. How could it possibly go down when you move people closer together, when you take down the walls between them? And I think the best way I can give you intuition about the answer is to say, look at an airplane. You know, when you when you get on an airplane, you know, yes, there's a there's always a chatty Kathy uh, on the plane somewhere uh, or, or chatty Charlie and more experience is more common. But um, but what most people do is they create little bubbles around themselves. You know, you put on headphones or or you look really intently at your computer like you don't want to be disturbed or you just send some uh, – you give some monosyllabic answers if, if someone tries to talk to you. People find a way to fight against these these tendencies. And so what's the moral of the story? I mean the moral on one hand is a little depressing because it says uh, there's a lot of unintended consequences that come uh, with our plans and, and systems are are very hard to think our way through. I think the practical moral of this story is when you got a big idea, uh, something as big as, you know, reorganizing the whole way your company is laid out, you got to test it first because you can't, you can't think your way through to all the conclusions. You can only test your way to the conclusions. And so, you know, if you're going to an open office floor plan, you sure are going to want to start with one department first or one team on one floor to try to feel out some of these dynamics. So in schools, w- was it a similar thing? Yeah, I think we kind of concluded as a profession that just the noise level and the distraction and the, you know, the constant sound of everybody else's classroom around you just, <laughs> you know, people people learn to work with it. You know, I think educators are generally not complainers and, and made it work. And, and often these were very long-term decisions. You know, schools had been built without classroom walls uh, and in many cases still exist that way because they haven't been renovated. And we haven't really been able to to adapt as quickly as we'd like because those were such bold decisions. So <laughs> it, it almost strikes me as a case where we have to do the qualitative research as well as look at the numbers. Like we have to look at the people and listen to the people. Yeah. Sometimes I wonder if, if any of the people planning these open office floor plans actually talk to people to ask if they wanted that or thought it would be a good idea. Like I, I know I would have said no. I mean, I'm, I'm a card carrying introvert, so maybe I'm different, but I would have fully foreseen the horror of that situation if someone had asked me as an employee. Dan, let me just ask uh, one last question then. Uh, if you could wave a magic wand and get school leaders everywhere to make one shift in their thinking or one shift in their behavior, uh, what would you have us do based on the research that went into Upstream? I would have you find some way in your week to step out of the tunnel. Uh, even if it's for an hour, uh, you know, a walk outside. And I would start engaging in that thought that we talked about earlier of what could I do to ensure that this problem that I'm burning a lot of time dealing with that recurs again and again that I've seen in my career, it's always going to be with me. What could I do to make sure next year I'm not facing as many instances of this problem as I do now? And and begin those explorations. Could I get early warning of this problem? How could I get closer to the problem so I really see uh, how it's assembled and where the leverage points might be? How could I get together a team that has different facets of this problem and get them collaborating in new ways? Because, you know, the only way to, to ensure that we're not forever stuck fishing drowning kids out of the river uh, is to start taking some steps upstream. So the book is Upstream, The Quest to Solve Problems Before They Happen. And uh, Dan, I really hope that senior leadership teams, you know, I'm thinking especially of district administrators, you know, superintendents and their cabinets will take this challenge seriously and uh, see your book as a guide to investigating and working together to, you know, to go upstream and to, to solve some of those pervasive problems. So Dan Heath, thank you so much for joining me on Principal Center Radio. Thank you. It's been fun. Thanks for listening to Principal Center Radio. For more great episodes, subscribe on our website at principalcenter.com slash radio.
Justin Bader, Ph.D., is a strategic advisor to senior leaders in K-12 organizations. To learn more about becoming a member of Dr. Bader's inner circle of executive thought leaders, request information about the Instructional Leadership Directors Roundtable at principalcenter.com slash roundtable. And here is a, a postscript. I want to make you an offer. If you're still listening to this conversation after 40 or 45 minutes or whatever it's been, if you found this interesting enough to stick with us, then you're somebody that I want to read this book. And I want to put my money where my mouth is. I'm going to offer you a free copy of this book. No strings, no nothing. All you got to do is go to heathbrothers.com. So that's Heath like Heath Ledger, heathbrothers.com slash principal. And there's going to be a form on that page to take your address. I should confess it's got to be a U.S. address. I'm sorry, Canadians. I'm sorry, international listeners. That's just the way it works with my publisher. You plug your address in there and I will send you a free hardcover of Upstream. No joke. Uh, I really want these ideas to spread and I want them to spread even more than I want the book sales. So I hope you'll make use of that. Um, we will have a hundred copies uh, available. So this uh, this is not an infinite offer. Act fast and all that. And I hope you enjoy that.